Good morning, church. First Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose ye one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call upon the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and dressed it, and called on the name of Baal, morning and even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, neither any nor any that answered. And they wept upon the altar that was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey. Or preadventure he sleepeth, and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner with knives and lances, until the blood gushed of out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, and there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me, all the, and all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the sons of Israel, of Jacob, of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, uh, unto whom the, world, the word of the Lord came, uh, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And, the, and with the stones he built the, an altar of, in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great it was con, as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood, wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and he said, Fill four barrels of four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar and filled the trench, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the, at the time of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God of in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the pe that this people might know that thou art the Lord, and thou and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and looked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and said, The Lord, he is God, and the Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And he, and they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook, and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up. Eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. And I'm going to stop there. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord. Father, I ask you to anoint me to preach. Anoint them to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The sacrifice and the rain. Elijah, Israel had not seen rain at this particular time. In three and a half years. They were in a drought. Because of their spiritual condition. They had went chasing after the gods of Baal. And so Elijah. The Lord had been dealing with Elijah. And finally Elijah calls. A meeting of the prophets of Baal. And himself onto Mount Carmel. And he reorganizes the, the sacrifice and lays it in order and gets everything good and set. And he offers sacrifice. He repairs the altar first, number one. Then he offers sacrifice. And he said, let the God that answer by fire, let him be God. See, the, the Baal worshipers also did a sacrifice unto their God. Read the text. And he said, 
Let the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And so he prepared the uh, sacrifice and poured water and saturated the sacrifice. That's important. Sacrifice, saturated the sacrifice with water. And when the fire of God fell on that sacrifice, church, it licked up not only the sacrifice, not only the wood, but the water that was in the trenches along with the stones. And when the, when it's over with, he tells, tells Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. My Lord, there is a sound of an abundance of rain. Rain here being a type of the Holy Spirit. Israel was in a drought, church. Crops had not grown in three and a half years. They were borderline starving to death. So, so Elijah prepares this altar and sacrifices to the Lord. And he tells Ahab, he says, Ahab, arise, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. And you go and you read a little bit further. Elijah sent, verse 43, Elijah said unto his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked, and he said, There is nothing. And Elijah said, go again seven times. Seven being God's number of perfection. And on the seventh time, the servant returns to Elijah and says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. The Lord sent rain on Israel to end the drought because of the sacrifice. My Lord. Look, y'all, I haven't preached in almost a month. So I'm a little bit amped up. So y'all are going to have to deal with it. But the Lord sent Rain because of the sacrifice. It wasn't because of Israel's faith or lack there. Well, yeah, it really was. It was because of Elijah repairing the altar and offering the correct sacrifice. Offering a sacrifice acceptable unto God. And then the rain fell. You go and you study Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple, when he dedicated the temple, he offered 144,000 lambs. And what was it? 22,000 oxen? And then the glory fell. We want the glory, but we don't want the cross. We want the reign of the Spirit, but we don't want the blood. We want Him to move, but we don't want the cross. We want supernatural victory, but we don't want the blood. We want... The, the, the blessing of God, but we don't want the cross. We want to feel good and feel tingly when we're in church, but we're not studying and praying outside of it. This is a relationship, church. This is not a Sunday and Wednesday Jesus.
This is supposed to be a daily relationship. He told his disciples in Luke. I believe it's Luke. I am the bread of life. Eat of me daily. Partake of the bread daily. That means studying and praying on a daily basis. But see, it gets hard because when we start this off, we're on fire. We're on cloud nine. And then, as time goes on, we're not seeing what we think we ought to see. So what happens? We stop. We stop. We stop studying. We stop praying. Let me tell you something, church. To see the glory and the reign of the Spirit that I believe is coming, that I believe in bits and pieces has been here, but it's just going to grow, we have to be in proper relationship. He is not going to send revival and a moving of his spirit to a church that is not in proper relationship. Because if he were to do that, we would end up like the like the 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 priest in the book of Israel or in the book of Israel, Lord, in the book of Exodus that offered strange fire. And what happened? The Lord smoked them dead. We cannot play with this book. It is time, myself included, to get serious about our relationship. Time to play church is over. Like I said, myself included. Myself at the front of the line. To see what I believe we are fitting to see, we must come back to the altar. We must repair and rebuild the altar. We must develop the prayer life, and the Bible study. We want to see revival. We want to see, we've been saying, Lord said revival. Lord said revival. Are we studying and praying? We're expecting him to move, but we're not putting in the work to see it happen. We're, 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 we're asking for, for, for his glory, but do we realize that his glory is holy? That his presence is holy? I'm going to say this and then I'm going to move on. Be careful what your flesh wants. Do you want revival for the miracles? Or do you want revival to draw closer to your father? See, he had to correct me of this too. Because over the last couple of weeks, I've been studying revivals. And I said, Lord, why do all of these revivals come in and spark out? Because they get their eyes on the miracles and not the miracle maker. See, they start out right. They start out with people seeking God. But then they get comfortable. And they get their fill 
And then they move on. And it sparks out. You go and you study the story of, of the widow with the barrel of meal and the oil. That oil did not stop flowing in those barrels until they stopped bringing them in. Which means we can have as much of the power and presence of God as we want. The reality of it is, is do we want him enough to let him deal with the most inner parts of our heart? The, the places that, that, that are strongholds that, that, Lord, I still enjoy that. Lord, I still want that. I'll let you deal with everything else, but that that's mine. I want that. Let me tell you something, church. Speaking from experience, it's easier to surrender. It is easier to surrender. Because once we get to the place where we lay it at his feet and say, Lord, it's yours. Here I am. Deal, do with me what you want to do. Okay. I'm going to give y'all one more example and then I'm going to wrap this up. Jacob, when he wrestled with the Lord, or when the Lord wrestled with him, after he touched the hollow of his thigh, what did the Lord say? He said, let me go for the day breaks. And Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm not letting you go. I now know who I'm dealing with and I'm not letting you go. And he, he, he blesses Jacob, and Jacob finally lets him go. Are we that desperate for God? Okay. The ten virgins you read in the Gospels. Five had oil in their lamps, five did not. Are we keeping our oil in our lamps knowing full well that he could call at any minute? But OJB, oh, that's not being taught now. Unfortunately, you're right. The rapture is not being taught, which makes me believe that the majority of the church no longer believes it. We want to know why the majority of the church is not preaching the gospel and getting souls saved. They no longer believe in judgment. They no longer believe in a rapture. They no longer believe in any of this stuff. You want to know why he's not sending revival? Because most, if not the majority, of churches today do not believe in it. They don't want the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'll take him. I want him all. I want as much of him as I can stand. Because the reality of it is this, church. Without his moving and guiding we end up in a mess. We end up in a mess. Plain and simple. But he only works through our faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary according to Romans 6, 7, and 8. We, we've got in this mindset of, well, the Holy Spirit's just automatic. He just works. No. 
if God was automatic and did everything he wanted to do, nobody would ever sin again. Nobody would ever slip up again. It's a constant allowing the Lord to clean us up. It's constant. And most people, when the Lord starts that because it's uncomfortable, we pull back. Instead of pressing into him to allow him to deal with it that much faster. The sacrifice and the rain. Church, I'm telling you right now. When we put our faith exclusively in Christ and what he did at Calvary, we will see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is promised in his word. But see, we want to separate the cross and the Holy Spirit. We want to separate Jesus and his finished work and the Holy Spirit. We can't. They're tied together. According to Romans 6, 7, and 8. But I'm going to, I'm going to give y'all a warning and then I'm done. I'm closing. When we start asking for this, because he did it with me. He'll start cleaning us up first. Individually. He'll start revealing things in our heart that's got to be changed. Individually. We want to see revival in the church. Revival starts in the heart of one individual. And then it spreads. It does. God does not work corporately he works on an individual level now that needs to be explained the work of the Holy Spirit is individual salvation is personal everything he does is personal but he also says where two or more are gathered in my name, I shall be in the midst of them. Could you imagine, church, what would happen if more people got together with in one mind and in one accord like they did in the book of Acts and prayed? I think we would be shocked. I think we would be shocked. But there is so much division that let me let me deal with that too and then I'm done. Division kills. Ultimately point blank. When it comes to the message of the cross, I won't compromise. When it comes to doctrine, I will not compromise. But there are things that are not necessarily, they're important, but they're not dogmatic. For example, the view on the rapture, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I believe in a pre-trib rapture. That's because he has not appointed us to wrath. But it's really immaterial. As long as you believe there is going to be a rapture. Because if, if there's not any such thing as a rapture, do you believe in the resurrection? They're both the same thing. See, there's little things like that that have driven a wedge in the church.
that needs to be addressed, that needs to be dealt with before it destroys the church. Now, once again, I'm not preaching compromise here. Not at all. If you're off in left field, sorry for you. I will. There's no fellowship there. But if you are learning and wanting to learn this message of the cross, who am I to tell you no? Who am I to say, just because you don't know it like we do, you're not learning it? Now, once again, there comes a point in time when you're teaching this and it's not accepted where you have to remove yourself. And that's where your personal relationship with the Lord comes in. Once again, it comes back to personal relationship. <clears throat> Are you spending time with your father? Are you studying his word? Or have you gotten comfortable with Sunday and Wednesday Christianity? The Bible says we are a bride for Christ. If we're a bride for Christ, doesn't that entail a daily relationship? Let, let's let's use it as a natural in a natural sense, church. If a spouse isn't talking to their mate, how long does that marriage last? Before it just falls apart and deteriorates. It can't last that long. You have to develop the relationship. It, once again, this is not an automatic thing. The question is, do we want it bad enough to pursue it? Do we want the reign of the Spirit bad enough to pursue Him for Him? Not for, not for revival. Not for this move of the Spirit. But for Him. Draw me, Lord, and I will run after you. It doesn't say I'll run after the miracles. It doesn't say I'll run after da 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 da. It says I will run after you. As a deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you. Are we that hungry for God? Myself included. Or are we comfortable? Because until we're removed out of our comfort zone, nothing's going to change, church. He has to allow a little bit of pressure. He did. Go read the book of Acts. The first, what was it? Five, six years of the church, they stayed in Israel. They didn't. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Not just Israel, the world. It wasn't until persecution came that they stepped out of their comfort zone. Father, I come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, Lord. Father, give us hunger for you. Give us a hunger for your anointing. Give us a deeper hunger to know you more. Draw us closer to you. As Peter laid upon your chest and listened to your heartbeat. Lord, that's my desire. 
That's how close I want to be. Draw us. And if there's anything that hinders that drawing us near, allow us to recognize it and allow you to rectify it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I will see y'all Wednesday night.